Hello, everyone. You should all uh, be able to hear me and uh, welcome, uh, welcome to the webinar, everyone. We are now live. I'm very excited to be with you all today. We have uh, a pretty fantastic webinar. So uh, just give me a minute. What we'll do is we'll get started. And the first thing uh, I want to do, we just have some quick housekeeping here today. First of all, if you can't hear me, you can't hear me say it. But a couple of people uh, last uh, time had some trouble. That's because for some reason, occasionally it will automatically mute. So if you can't hear me, <laughs> hopefully you're reading. Uh, just make sure you don't have the mute button selected down there. Um, and that hopefully should solve the problem. And Final uh, bit of housekeeping before we kind of get into some content. We're going to have some prizes today. Now, prizes are going to depend on where you are based. They might be an experience. It could be a gift card. Uh, it might be a dinner. Could be lots of different things. Um, so participate in this webinar. So there are a couple of ways to participate. You'll notice on the right-hand side of the page, there is a polls button. I've added some polls in there. Answering polls gives you points. You can also participate into the chat. So uh, the chat can get pretty busy. So I one other area is if you do have a specific question you want to ask myself or one of the fantastic presenters that we have today, then there's an ask a question button. Um, and that means you can ask questions. You can upvote other questions. And this way, we'll actually be able to see your questions. So you'll see the chat at the top. Just below that on the right, you have ask a question. Then you have the polls. Participating in all of that helps you get prizes, and um, yeah, and uh, we all we all love we all love a good prize. So first up, we have four speakers, including myself today. Uh, we're kind of pretty well spread across the world uh, at 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 the moment, but where about are you tuning in from? I love to see where everyone is tuning in from. So in the comments. Uh, section. Just uh, let us know where you're where you're tuning in from. Right now, I'm in Paris, in France. Usually, I'm in the Netherlands. Um, and then we have uh, guests from Boston and Denver that are coming on. So pretty excited. So where have we got? We've got Mexico City, San Francisco. Oh no, SFO, India, Kansas City, Bulgaria. Ah, cool, Costa Rica, Antwerp in Belgium. I love Antwerp. Some more from Paris, Seattle, Colorado, California, Prague. I do love Prague. I'm in Prague soon, actually, for the Qubit conference in Prague. Texas. Oh, awesome. Dublin. I'm going to be in Dublin this weekend, speaking at PyCon, uh, PyCon Ireland, which is actually in Limerick, but I'm taking a little trip across to Dublin. Oh, great. It's amazing to see where everyone is from. It's uh, yeah, it's it's so cool to see such a, a a universal audience that we have here. All right, so we've got people tuning in from Crowdcast and on LinkedIn. If you're on LinkedIn, I'll do my best to try and keep an eye on the comments and the likes and the views and stuff that's going on. But I can't do my best. But if you're in Crowdcast, I will definitely see where you're tuning in from. So a little bit about the format before we get started. Uh, today is all about our State of Secrets Brawl report. I'm going to present some high-level findings um, that we have in the report. Then I'm excited to say that our CEO is here with us today. He's going to be joining us, and he's going to answer some questions rounding the facts and, and how we found and what we kind of found in the report. Then we've got the CEO of Dark Owl, another fantastic company. And we're going to be talking about secrets on the dark web and other areas of the dark web. So that's going to be really interesting. I can't wait for that section. You may notice that, uh, that Dark Owl participated in our report, if you've read it this year. So we've got some more facts than just from Git Guardian. And then finally, we have uh, a hacker with us to give us the hacking perspective. We have Philippe, who is from NetRegard. And Philippe is the chief hacking officer. And so NetRegard is a company that does lots of services, but one of their services is pen testing. So Philippe gets paid to hack into systems. And he's going to tell us how he finds and uses secrets uh, to hack into everything. So 
to be completely honest, I want to get my part done and out the way as quickly as possible because I want to hear, and I'm sure you want to hear from these other people as well. So let's not waste any time. Let's get straight into it. Now, I'm sure most people here understand this, but just in case, or if someone's watching this on YouTube after the fact, what are secrets? What are we talking about? So secrets are digital authentication credentials. It's a fancy word for saying things like API keys, other credential peers, like you know your database credentials or your username password peers, um, security certificates. There's, there's a bunch more, but these are kind of the crux of what we're talking about. These are what we use in software to be able to authenticate ourselves, to be able to ingest data, to decrypt data, to be able to access into different systems. So these are our crown jewels. What we're talking about today is how these leak out from our control into the public and into our other infrastructure. So that's just a quick recap, recap of what secrets are. So what did we find in our report? So the state of secrets rule is a report that we have been doing since 2021. And it outlines essentially what GitGuardian has found throughout the previous year of scanning for secrets. So one of the main areas GitGuardian looks for secrets, or probably the main area, is on public GitHub repositories. So uh, GitHub is a pretty massive platform. You may be familiar with it. I'm sure most of you are. There's millions and millions of developers on GitHub and billions of code, billions of lines of code and billions of commits that get added every single year into this huge data set of source code. We scan all of it every single year to actually uncover, hey, how much sensitive information is being leaked on GitHub? And we also have some stat statistics about other areas, but we'll start off with what we find in GitHub. So last year, we scanned over 1 billion commits throughout the entire year of 2022. So a commit is a contribution of code to a public repository in GitHub. That's what we're classing as a commit. If you're not familiar with the terminology, you can think of it like uploading code. Right. This happened a billion times last year in 2022. So it's a huge amount of developers. There's 94 million developers on GitHub and 85 million new repositories. So the numbers on GitHub are pretty astounding. Now, uh, one small element down there you might not see is that actually HCL, HashiCorp Configuration Language, is the fastest growing language on GitHub. This is interesting because this is an infrastructure as code language. We had a webinar last week, last month about infrastructure as code. Uh, so this is actually kind of bringing about, infrastructure as code brings about new types of secrets, right? We're used to having them hard coded in our source code. Now we've got them hard coding in our infrastructure as code. And this is growing on GitHub as well. So down there in the polls, You'll notice one of them is how many secrets do you think we found in 2023? I said no cheating. I suspect that some of you guys have cheated because the correct answer is overwhelmingly winning here. Um, so we have released our port, so some of you may have already seen this. But we found 10 million secrets in public GitHub last year. This is an absolutely huge number. So what we're talking about, those API keys, those credentials, we found 10 million of them in public. So it's a pretty astounding number. And we're going to break down exactly what we found in this report. But essentially, what you need to know is that this increased by about 67%. And this is pretty alarming because the increase in volume rose by about 20% last year. So the volume went up by 20% but we still found much more than 20% uh, extra secrets this year. Last year, we found 6 million, uh, if you were around for, for the report last year. So 10 million is a pretty astonishing number that we have in there. Um, now, the other area that may explain some of it is that we expanded our detection, but not nearly enough 
by, by this amount. So it shows that the problem is really kind of growing, which is quite alarming. So this is the kind of evolution that we found. And there's a couple of things on here that really stand out for me. Um, it's probably some of the scariest things uh, about what happened this year. So the number one thing for me is the one in 10 that you see at the right. What does that mean? So there was 13 million unique authors that committed code last year. 13 million developers leaked code, uh, pu pushed, not leaked, sorry, pushed code publicly last year. Uh, so if you're wondering why this is so far off the 94 million that uh, GitHub claimed, that's because not all users push code actively and then pushing code publicly, they may be pushing code privately, but we're just talking about public contributions, public commits. One in 10 leaked a secret. One out of 10 developers that push code publicly leaked a secret. To me, this is the most alarming statistic. This can finally put to bed that it's not just kind of junior developers doing this and there's other evidence that we have around that um so this shows that it's a really big problem uh, and something that's going to that that's going to happen to a lot of us so for me that's a, a standout of there we also can see that about five five and a half commits out of a thousand expose at least one secret and so this is the, the probably the biggest like oranges to oranges comparison that we have to last year and it showed that and that increased that number increased by 50 percent so the total number increased by 60%, but kind of on an oranges to oranges basis, apples to apples, it's increased by about 50%. So pretty alarming statistics uh, that we see in there. Uh, now, this is a slide here. What countries leaked the most secrets? This slide, to me, doesn't it show what it appears to show. This, this, this slide doesn't really show that India is the worst country for leaking secrets. This slide shows that probably India, China, and the US, what do these countries all have in common? Uh, they've got big populations and they've got strong developer bases. So I think uh, you, we can take this with, with a grain of salt. We're not saying, hey, India is the worst country for leaking it, but we can kind of see that this is actually in line with what we'll see with large engineering populations. So, I mean, some interesting statistics that we that we have are uh, in there. If you're wondering why China isn't number one, based on just that that'd be the largest population, there's GitHub alternatives in China that are commonly used. Uh, so that probably explains that. So this more shows, you know, the frequency of, of use. All right, some other areas here. So one of the polls that I also had is what type of secret you thought we would leak the most. Uh, and this one, this one you didn't cheat on because this one you got wrong. So it, the polls show 77% think that it is private keys. It's actually not. The largest leaker is actually data storage keys, which was ranked the lowest. It was only one vote for data storage keys. Next on the list is cloud provider keys, then messaging systems, and then private keys. So this is actually probably pretty interesting because you know private keys are, are difficult uh, to you know they're, they're probably you would think that that'd be more prevalent because uh, you use them but a lot of different keys leak keys leak all the time um, and if we kind of look at the 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 generic detectors so we have specific detectors and generic detectors so a specific detector is like for a cloud provider it would be like AWS GCP. And then we also have detectors that catch what's left over, which is kind of, we know that this is a secret, we know that this is sensitive, but we don't know what exactly it is for. Um, this will be like a username password. So we don't know what system this username and password actually gives access to. We're confident that it's real, but we don't have the additional information uh, from that. And so we have different types of generic detectors. So generic password is a number one generic entropy string, but we also have different types like username and passwords coming in at 2.8%. So pretty big jumps in there. So this is kind of what we actually find. Uh, another poll in here is kind of what name of file did everyone think uh, would commonly leak secrets? And so we have uh, env config settings.pem, so config.py, config js config not hcl whatever they may be that will be under config and actually the the biggest leaker that we have 
Um, I don't have a slide for it. It's actually in the files. This is the most sensitive file. And this is one that can be prevented easily with a .git ignore file. We shouldn't be letting .env files in our repositories. Uh, so this one he here is quite interesting. And if we're looking at unique detectors, the number one detector that we find is the Google API keys. Next to that, we have RSA private keys, generic private keys, cloud keys, Postgres SQL. And then we also have GitHub access tokens. This one's quite scary. This is saying that you've put your access token that allows an attacker or someone to be able to see your, your private All right, I should be back. Hopefully, I'm back. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I just got booted off by someone else. So um, hopefully, all will be good and right in the world again. Um, if y'all can let me know in the chat that you can hear me. Um, yeah, OK, great. Sorry about that, guys. Quick technical issue, but we're back on track. I'm just going to reshare uh, my slides. Give me one second. Uh, OK. Well, with that, I think it's a, a, a good opportunity now to actually bring on our first guest uh, to talk about uh, the next uh, area. So I would like to welcome onto the stage our CEO um, and founder, which is uh, Eric Foyer. So I'm just going to bring him onto the stage right now. Just bear with me one minute. Eric, welcome. Welcome to the show. Yeah, All right. nice. Great to be on the show. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, good, to, good to have you here. All right, Eric, I'm going to dive straight into some questions here. And uh, I'm going to go a little bit. Uh, I've sent questions. <laughs> usually, usually it takes me at least one question to go off script, but I'm, I'm going to go a little bit out of order here. One of the things that I, I know a lot of people are interested in is how did GitGuardian start and why did you start scanning public GitHub uh, for, for, for secrets and, and other areas? How did this all kind of come about? Yes, yeah, actually, it's a, it's a great question. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm a former like uh, engineer and data scientist, so my my background is more like data science and data engineering. You can you can basically see it in the report. We share a lot of of data, analyze tons of of data. So uh, as a data scientist, I was used uh, to work a lot with um, with teams of other data scientists, and we use a lot the cloud and and the cloud keys to to connect to the service to be able to manipulate data and and, and provide statistics on it and Actually, at my time there, I was like uh, really, uh, I, I really saw the problem of, of credential leaks, uh, for example, AWS secrets um, in uh, in Jupyter Notebook, just to to connect to um, easily to uh, to to your pipelines, and I was like seeing a lot of of actually credential leaks, and yeah, as the, as a good like I would say that I was like, okay, this is definitely an issue. And uh, could I like some? Could we train some algorithm and try some some models to uh, to to resolve this issue at scale? And yeah, GitHub like was a, actually a fantastic uh, database of source code where I could train uh, this model to detect secrets. And it started just like I would say as a simple side project to to see if we uh, 
uh, what we could find uh, on on GitHub, and it started by just yeah analyzing the full uh, real time flow of of commits on GitHub, starting with a few uh, at the time a few detectors. So at, I think it was like yeah. I, AWS, we started with AWS, maybe SendGrid, and um, and Twilio at the time, and already with the first the first MVP, we were able to find like, yes, 300, 400 secrets a day. Now you can see it's way more, it's more like four, 5,000 a day. And yeah, uh, after that, I would say everything went really quickly. We released a, a pro bono alerting, so this uh, idea of at each time we were able to find the key on GitHub, we send an alert to the developer saying, uh, you basically leak the secret here on public GitHub, and after like yeah, we received a really good feedback from the the community, created a free application for the developers, and after like monetize uh, uh, with uh, with product for for enterprise, and yeah, we we I will say we we continue with this like yeah product led growth approach and 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 shift left approach, putting yeah the developers. Uh, uh, trying to help the developer to, to write secure code and yeah, started this way and continuing on this path. It's super interesting, you know, as, as amazing that it started off as a simple project and what it's grown into. I'm sitting in an office, we've got the, you know, 100 people here and uh, we're, we're starting to outgrow it now and it started off as a, as a, as a side project for a geeky data scientist. Yeah. <laughs> um, let, let's talk about the report a little bit more. What what has led to this increase in secrets leaking? We, we're seeing it every year, and it's not by like a marginal amount where it could be some small factors. Why do you, do you have any ideas, insights into why we we kind of seeing this problem persist and, and keep going? Yeah, it's it's a combination of multiple elements. First, like uh, first a few like that's highlighted in the report is like we are. There is more and more developers on GitHub, so we are scanning more and more commits. So the, we have analyzed actually and scanned 20% more commits this year than last year. But as, as you said, it's, it cannot just the increase of, of the commits we are scanning. It cannot explain the number of secrets we are finding. So on the other side, we are also improving our sequence detection engine, uh, meaning we are like adding new detectors, so detecting new type of secrets, but also improving our existing detectors, meaning trying to improve the, the recall, so our ability to detect secrets, and and trying also, while trying to keep the precision really high, meaning not detecting too many false positives. So we always try to, especially on public data, um, keep a, a, a precision rate of 70%, so like, uh, because it's, yeah, it's a huge, I would say really important in in all security products is not like loading like security team with too many false positives because after they just don't look uh, at the alerts anymore. Mm -hmm. And I will say yeah, the third point is even even with that, uh, the problem is not going away. So there is yeah, you can find multiple ways to explain it. More and more developers on the market so that don't know really Git uh, that need to learn. And so it's it's always uh, uh, you can see in the report that like, there is not obvious correlation between seniority and and the amount of secret seek, but still like uh, it can be like the, the growth of of developers and the growth of junior developers uh, can can also explain well, well yeah secrets are are still leaking. It's definitely I would say the issue is definitely not solved uh, on the on the public side and uh, on the internal side. Yeah, it is. I mean, it is interesting. B being completely honest, uh, I expected the number to remain the same. I was even slightly expecting it to go down this year because you know there there are some initiatives uh, and the, the problem we've kind of become a bit more aware of it. So I was quite surprised to see that actually we, we took another big jump up. Um, so for 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 you, was there anything that stood out in the report? when it all got compiled that was surprising to you you've been scanning public github for longer than any of us <laughs> so what does there anything surprise you at this point or was there something in the report this year that was that still continues to surprise you seven years on yeah i'm i'm i really like this fun fact i'm i'm like always amazed by the um the correlation of the number of secrets we find the number of secrets leaked and the popularity of uh, API vendors and, and providers. I, I we had we have this really fun 
statistic with open 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 AI API key, so the API key to to connect programmatically to ChatGPT. That when from we were like finding maybe 100 a day in early 2022, and now we are finding more than 3,000 uh, secrets. Uh, so 100 a week, sorry, and now we are finding 3,000 secrets uh, leaked per week. So it it jumped like it, yeah, it's 30 times more. Uh, now than uh, one year ago, and it's it's just I think it just surpassed like Google API key. So now and and, wow. and you can see it's really correlated with the uh, with the trend of uh, of OpenAI right now with developers and and in in the tech in general. And yeah, the other thing is the number of leaks actually uh, that are correlated to to the use of a, of a secret. So I think it's it's amazing to to see that in a lot of the past leaks. Uh, uh, Okta, if you look at Okta, CodeCov, uh, Slack, and, and all the, the ones that are in the report, it's at, at some point, uh, you, it's secret is not the, I would say, the starting point of the attack, but at some point, um, hacker is able to, to find the secrets to leverage uh, the attack and do lateral movement. And yeah, I'm, I'm also amazed also by some vendors that, yeah, when they have those code leaks, just try to minimize the incident and yeah. For us, as a, as scanning the whole open source code, we definitely know that if a company looks is leaking its source code, is would leak to, uh, they will also leak secrets, and so they will leak PII. So, like just declaring that leaking source code is not bad because it's not confidential information is a little bit, I will say maybe naive, um, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm still amazed. Like, but yeah, it it just shows that we have still a lot of education to do. Yeah, okay. Well, that kind of segues me into my, my final question for you before we move on to the, the next get here. You talked a little bit about education this year. This is a two-part question. What what can we actually do about leaked, leaked secrets? And one, from an organization. So what can an organization do? And two, what can we as a community at whole, like what, what can we as developers and, and community, what can we do to try and you know, keep this problem, well, prevent it from getting worse and, and potentially maybe one year, you know, the number of secrets going down even. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a really, really interesting uh, uh, question. So I think now it, it's really, uh, especially on like secrets publicly leaked on, on GitHub, you, at, I think at, a, at some, when you reach as a company, as an organization, when you reach a certain size of developers, uh, what was, a probability of leaking secrets become, I will say, more a certitude. So it means like you uh, you will leak secrets and you're just waiting uh, for, for it to happen. So you definitely uh, need to put some some mitigation in place. And especially after, for I will say, internal, when you look at more secrets in internal repos, uh, it's uh, we know like uh, we find way more secrets in internal repo than public repo. It's really um, the I would say the big challenge for our company is uh, the remediation. So how it's it's you, you you are we are able to you can detect all these secrets, but after all, how how you remove it from 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 source code and and I think on the industry and and technology uh, point of view, it's it's really interesting. There is some uh, some stuff happening right now with uh, especially for password with the. Uh, uh, FIDO Alliance, or so trying to replace uh, password with with passkey. So, but of course, these these initiatives are great, but they would take uh, years, even tens, yeah, dozens of years probably. And it's it's more like designed for for password authentication, that API keys and machine to machine authentication. So, in the in the I will say API keys in secret world, you have like the rise of of secrets manager like Vault and uh, and that are trying to um, to 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 push like dynamic secrets and short lived C tokens, which are great uh, in some point. But yeah, definitely to generate this short lived token, dynamic tokens, uh, you need long lived tokens. That yeah, we all know that <laughs> developer hate uh, regenerating token and generating this short lived token, and they prefer to to use long lived token and and store them once in their source code and environment variable. So. There is, there are definitely, there are solutions, uh, just generally, and but but really, really promising on this side. Uh, I will say more on the tech 
technology side. So on the detection side, I think there are a lot of work is has, has been done. If you were looking at some API providers, uh, they have been like doing uh, some some we work to prefix the key, so it's more easy. It's easier for uh, sequence detection company like us or, or other vendors to to detect them. Uh, it can be actually it's uh, it can be um, a little bit also a controversy because it means that it's also easier for attacker to take them. So maybe it could be interesting to work on um, on some other way to do it. Maybe uh, like signatures that are only known by defense team and stuff like that. But yeah, definitely I think there is definitely some some innovation here, but still can improve. We can we can I think we can do better. And uh, yeah, I think the big focus now. I, you have a lot detection is more is becoming uh, more and more performant on the on sort of the defense side and it's really uh it's really i would say the big big target and big goal for companies in prevention and remediation so how how i make sure that uh, there is no more secrets entering in my code base and that the historic secrets are removed and i i achieve this zero secrets in code uh, state and yeah there is like a lot i think it's it's really the uh, the big challenge here is how to how to do remediation at scale so you can use uh, shift left and pre-commit for, for developers educating developers and really try um especially for large companies to to remediate at scale and it's a big challenge and we we have seen it with with our customers and and it's definitely something we are we are pushing for it's really i would say this this maturity for us as as a vendor has shifted from yeah being able to detect and it's always uh, um, really important to be able to detect secrets so have a good recall and good precision but now it's really how uh, we can remove all these secrets from uh, from the code base and and make sure that we we are we have no more secrets in code right yeah it's interesting you're talking about the, the problem shifting from it being difficult to detect them now it's difficult to to remediate them well yeah uh, eric I'm, uh, I'm going to thank you so much for, for joining us. Now, to everyone who wants to ask a question to Eric, we're going to bring all the speakers back at the end for a panel discussion. So if you want to ask a question specifically to Eric, just put Eric uh, in your question when you put it in the questions tab, not in the chat, because uh, it will get lost. Um, but thank you, Eric. And uh, I'm going to hide you now, but I'll see you uh, in a little while. OK, so we're going to move on to our next speaker now which is uh, very exciting. We have Mark, who is the CEO of Dark Owl. Uh, we'll explain a little bit about, uh, well, he will explain a little bit about what Dark Owl uh, does. I'm going to bring him to the stage right now. Uh, I'm just going to unmute you uh, now, or if you could unmute yourself. Oh, I, wait, I'm, I'm unmuted. Welcome, Mark. Thank you. Very nice to be here. Thanks for having me, McKenzie. So uh, my first question is that people may be familiar with Geek Guardian, but they may not uh, be familiar with Dark Owl exactly. Can you tell me a little bit about uh, Dark Owl as an organization and, uh, and how you kind of fit in into this discussion today? Great. Um, Dark Owl's uh, about five years old. Uh, we are a company that extracts data at scale uh, from the dark nets. And I use dark nets as a plural. I'll come on to that. Um, and well, the reason we do that is um, we've accumulated what's probably the world's largest archive of, um, of darknet data uh, in the world that's commercially available. Now, why, why is it important for someone to do that? It's important because uh, many of the secrets that we're discussing in this report and that we are discussing here today are available for sale or for trade or oftentimes just for free in the darknet. And any organization trying to assess risk and trying to assess where their where their risk lies has to have eyes on the darknet across the darknet uh, to be able to see where their exposure um, where their exposure might be. And we provide that for our clients. Our clients uh, include many of the world's largest cybersecurity companies as well as as governments who are monitoring the darknet uh, for criminal activity. As you can see on this. This slide here, we provide that data through a number of different means to uh, to our clients. All right, 
This is you touched on it a little bit, so I'm going to dive into your point here. Sure. You said dark webs, plural. <laughs> what I, what is the dark web, and how is it? You know, how has it evolved to perhaps what I might have thought about it ten five years ago? Yeah, it's a that's a very good question because different people refer to dark web or dark net as 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 very different things. Traditionally, the dark net um, uh, originally referred to the Tor network. Tor network was um, originally, ironically, set up by the U.S. government as a as a uh, secure communication platform. Uh, but the 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 key defining feature of any dark net, including Tor, which survives to this day, is um, is the uh, obfuscation of user identities, but the ability to continue to communicate in spite of the fact that uh, a message or an email uh, uh, or a communication can be intercepted uh, by somebody sitting in the middle, but still cannot tell who the the, uh, the users are. So obfuscation of identities makes it an ideal um, environment for criminals to um, uh, for criminals to operate in. This slide right here is actually a very good representation of that. When we talk about the dark net, we're talking about the bottom of the slide. I mentioned Tor, I2P, ZeroNet. There are a range of other uh, of, of other dark nets that have grown up, and these are places. They generally require a, a proprietary browser, which can which is easily available uh, to get access to. And these are places where um, people can go and congregate and discuss among themselves and trade data and sell product and sell goods. Um, where the user identity is obfuscated. The reason why I, your question is a good one is that people oftentimes um, confuse the dark net with the deep web or even some high risk surface websites or, or messaging platforms. So right directly above it on this slide, you see the deep web. There are a, run, a range of criminal forums, marketplaces that exist in the deep web. We watch those as well. Everything on, in red on this slide, we collect data from. And then there are high risk surface sites, particularly pay sites, where data is, 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 um, is posted from the dark net. Increasingly, and this is a real um, uh, significant trend in, in our business, increasingly hackers, hacktivists, uh, malicious actors are turning to direct messaging platforms, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, networks. The, the, the most active of those right now is Telegram. And so we collect uh, data from those sites as well. Um, and, and, and again, going back to the uh, original comment, having eyes on the data that is in these environments is critical for any organization to understand their exposure. Okay. Got it. I think I've got a, a bit of a better idea about this all now. Um, so going, kind of putting this in context with the report that we kind of released, how do these secrets, you know, and other credentials and areas end up on the dark web? And if a credential was leaked in public GitHub, for example, is it possible that that will end up in the dark web, uh, you know, for sale, for free, as you mentioned, another way? Yes, absolutely. And so the first question is, how do how do secrets make their way to the dark web? That we had, we estimate that well over ninety percent of the dark web today is now a malicious actor. So hacktivists, um, um, uh, ransomware operators, uh, oftentimes nation states uh, or actors um, acting on behalf of nation states in the dark net, sharing secrets, um, trading secrets, selling secrets, um, and it, it is the core marketplace for this type of activity. Uh, that it goes on, and in, in, in the Git Guardian report, you see this very clearly. When you look at the range of statistics, many of those API keys, many of those credentials, uh, certs, IP addresses, known vulnerabilities, um, code is put into the darknet either for sale or oftentimes you will see actors. Um, this is very common in the darknet. Actors will simply share their secrets or share a portion of their secrets for free in order to. Uh, effectively gain a reputation or gain points on a site to then be able to sell data at subsequent point. So there's an enormous amount of data that is available that is available um, uh, in the darknet uh, if somebody just goes in there and see and sees it. The challenge without a platform like ours is to search the darknet more co comprehensively and say I'm looking for a specific API key or a type of API key, and and I want to see where these are appearing. Without a without a, a platform like ours, you don't have the ability to do that. One one mention, just looking at this slide right here, uh, this slide is I think a couple of months out of date. Uh, at the bottom, you see some of the um, some of the statistics that exist in our database. We've taken in the last 24 hours 8.4 million documents out of the 
uh, out of the um, uh, the darknet. Uh, latest count as of yesterday, I think we have 9.4 billion credentials. Five billion of those have oh, passwords right. associated with them uh, in our database. And obviously, you know, we <laughs> now we. It's just, it's stunning, actually, how much data is both shared and then reshared in the darknet. So we have access to that. It is um, it it really is staggering the scale of what's going on here. And I'll just pause and say one more thing, which is the darknet and the use of the darknet by these actors is growing. More darknets are being set up. More data is being shared. This goes to your point, Mackenzie, with Eric, which is what? How do you how do you actually how do you mitigate this? We're seeing more and more data, not less and less data. Uh, available. Wow, that's uh, it's very interesting. Now you've already touched on a couple of uh, my like my questions that I had ready for you uh, lined up. <laughs> so I'll ask you one more before I uh, before I bring on our, our next guest. But are you seeing you you talked about kind of it shifting in, in platforms? Are you seeing any other trends in in their in their dark web that we should all be kind of aware of or or should know about? Well, we are, and and um, I mentioned one, which is the increasing shift to peer-to-peer -peer, uh, um, me messaging platforms like Telegram, Discord, and so on. Another trend that's been very interesting over the last 24 months is the the impact of the Ukraine war on the darknet. Um, we've right. seen uh, criminal groups on the darknet split apart as a result of the Ukraine war and, and spill each other's secrets into the darknet. So ransomware gangs in particular have split apart. Uh, some backing Russia, some backing Ukraine, and sh and shared each other's secrets. And and what is what is really shocking is to be able to see their inner workings of how these criminal gangs operate. Uh, and and so all of that is available as well uh, on the dark net. But it affects what we're talking about here today, because many of the ways that these um, uh, code repositories or um, or publicly available secrets are then exploited is uh, they're exploited by these very gangs. And you will see discussions about this, this vulnerability. Here's a set of AWS keys that we can use to get access to certain types of, uh, of networks. Um, you can see those discussions in live time unfold on the darknet. Wow. <laughs> it's very alarming. I'm getting, I'm getting more and more concerned as this webinar goes on. But uh, Mark, Hey, thanks so much for, for being here. Just a reminder uh, that uh, Mark is going to be with us for the panel session at the end as well in about uh, uh, 10 minutes. So if you have any questions, now's your time to, to answer them. Just make sure you, you mention Mark in there. So Mark, I'm going to hide you for the moment. I'm going to put you back on mute, and uh, I'll see you uh, shortly. All right. So we have another guest here. Now, this one is going to be really interesting because uh, we brought on a hacker here. So I'm going to bring Philippe onto the stage right here. All right. Uh, Philippe, if you could just unmute yourself for the moment, that would be great. There you go. Hello. Excellent. Welcome. Welcome, Philippe. I'm going to uh, hide my slides for a minute now and just invite you to share because I know that you have some slides uh, that you want to I'll, I can share it after. Share it it's well. more of a examples, but um, yeah, we can. Okay, maybe, fantastic. Uh, go through some of the, the, the questions that we may have. All right. So, our uh, first question, and I think one that I have, one that probably everyone has, is that from the hacker's perspective, you, how do you, well, perhaps before we get into this, maybe if you could explain a little bit about what you do and what Network Guard do so everyone has some context about the, 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 the questions that I'm going to ask. You could spend maybe just a, a minute to give you a high-level overview about the, what you do as the chief hacking officer at NetforGuard. <laughs> so we hack our customers. We get paid to, to hack our, our, our customers. Uh, uh, basically, penetration testing is uh, uh, attack, attack simulation. Uh, so we'll use the same tools and techniques and procedures as uh, um, uh, attackers or, or uh, black hackers uh, uh, would use. Uh, with the only difference that at the end we write a report that we publish to our customers instead of, of stealing money or, or publishing the, the, the information that we uh, steal uh, on the internet. <laughs> but from all that, I mean, you basically operate the same way a hacker would. Exactly you, the you same way. Uh, exactly the same way. Uh, and it goes both ways. So we simulate some of attacks that we uh, uh, see in the wild from attackers, uh, but we also try to come with novel uh, 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 techniques uh, uh, or attacks 
that are then being mirrored by the by the bad guys. So uh, it it goes both ways. But um, yeah, that's we pretty much used exactly the same the same techniques and and procedures. Okay, so with that in mind, uh, how is it that 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 hackers actually find um, and 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 use these secrets? You know, in the we talked about them being on the dark web. We're talking about them being in public. How do you discover them? How do you use them? Yeah. So yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I, I like to say that the the internet never forgets. So everything that it gets published on the internet, uh, whether it's voluntarily or not, uh, an attacker uh, will find it and will uh, uh, try to exploit it. Um, so it's just it's not a matter of if; it's a matter of when. It's just a matter of time when it's going to 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 be discovered by an attacker, as long as it's published. Um, so a few years back, uh, uh, we used to have a few scripts and monitoring some of the, 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 the dark web and trying to find some uh, uh, secrets uh, and using Google Docs uh, to find those secrets. Uh, but nowadays, there's a company like GigGuardian or, or Dakar World that uh, does a way better job than, than uh, us at finding those secrets. Uh, so typically, we actually use those platforms to, to to find the secrets. Uh, the goal of the pen test is not necessarily to just find the secret, but it's to show what we can do with the secret. So go beyond uh, uh, identifying the secret, but it's to exploit it and go uh, uh, beyond that. Right, because I, this is something that you know like a lot of people have you know have questions about too. Is that okay if I if I leak a, a Slack credential, for example? You know, like what does it really a threat? All you can do is post into a Slack channel, you know, but you can use those types of secrets to 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 get more content. You. you can do more things than people expect with secrets. Uh, absolutely. Uh, and Slack is one of my, my favorite uh, uh, key to be leaked because it's plenty of information that are not necessarily public, but that we get access to by just having one uh, uh, um, API key. I'll give you one example. Uh, in one of the tests, we actually found uh, an API key. Um, for a, a Slack um, a user, use this key to actually start monitoring everything that was happening uh, uh, on the, the, the Slack for these customers, all the channels. Uh, there's a nice API for Slack that's called uh, real-time messaging. So you can actually uh, um, get all the messages in real time. Uh, and then we just sat here for like a week waiting for developers to share secrets or uh, uh, um, uh, Secrets to be yeah to, to be shared. Um, we didn't stop here. We didn't wait for a week. We were doing some other uh, uh, tests and, and attacks. And uh, I remember at some point we managed to compromise uh, one employee, his workstation. Um, the IT security team discovered that they uh, that we compromised this workstation through some some alerts, and they started to do the investigation. And the way they did the investigation was ping the guy on Slack and say, hey, can you join this uh, 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 WebEx and share your screen so we can look at your computer because the user was remote. Uh, of course, we had access to Slack. So we joined the WebEx meeting and we sat for six hours looking at our customers doing the investigation, like the uh, incident investigation and trying to find <laughs> what we've uh, uh, compromised. Um, so yeah, let's, <laughs> let's start stopping at getting the key. It's to go all the way there and try to identify all the Possible improvement uh, uh, that uh, uh, customers could, could could do to to prevent it. So it's not secrets are going to happen, but what can you do to lower the uh, the the impact uh, uh, if it's going to to happen? Can you detect it uh, uh, quickly? And even if it's leaked and it's being exploited, how far can the attacker go? Can they compromise everything from there? Can get access to more secrets, or can or will they be stuck after the, the first uh, uh, exploitation attempt? Okay, so with that in mind, um, I know that you prepared uh, you know, some examples. Could you give us some examples of, of uh, some attacks that you've done where you've actually uh, used secrets and, and how you've used these in real life attacking exploits? Sure, uh, let me see if I can, uh, I cannot share my screen, I think it's. Oh. Should just be down the bottom, down the bottom right, just next to the chat. Oh. If not, um, I have a copy of your slides, so I, I uh, can yeah. So is that the the screen is shared already? I guess. Yep. Let's see if I can share just the slides. Okay. Uh, let me see. One second. Uh, 
I have them. Uh, I have them right okay. here. If you want uh, to just, uh... I got it too. Oh, I got... oh. Sorry about okay. that. No problem. Oh, it's being used. Yeah, you can chat. It's, I don't know for some reason it's. Uh... No problem. We have backup for this reason. <laughs> awesome. Um, so yeah, a few examples is one one of these uh, example. Uh, it's pretty common uh, um, folder that are uh, uh, stored on a web server, hoping that nobody would find it or for some reason they uh, uh, shared it. Uh, this was just reports. So it's just a matter of finding it uh, um, by browsing to the slash report. We could find all these uh, uh, documents. What was interesting in this uh, uh, document, and you'll see in the next uh, uh, slide, was actually uh, uh, configuration file. So that was a, a, a telecom company, and that was a configuration file of, of their customers' um, uh, routers, including passwords and keys and, and all that. Um, you would, you can uh, ask the question: Is is this a problem of misconfiguring the server, or the developer or whoever came up with the idea to share the reports in a public website uh, with with secrets? Uh, I would argue that's not even the, the configuration of the uh, of the web server. The name of this file could have been found. It's just it was easier that the directory listing was enabled and we could find the files. Uh, but otherwise, it's just a matter of time to just try to enumerate and, and guess those uh, uh, those files. Um, so anything that is on a in the internet on a server that is exposed to the internet uh, should be considered public, uh, whether it's like hidden somewhere or not. Uh, an attacker will find it at some point. Um, and then we can find like this. These are my my favorite. If you go to the next uh, uh, slide, plenty of of tools uh, used by developers. Uh, this one again was trying to hide it into a secret folder somewhere on the website. Uh, and these are tools that are used by developers to try to debug their uh, uh, software or programs. Uh, these are my, my favorite because there's not even a security. It's just like we're we're able to send queries straight into the database. We don't even have to exploit any vulnerability. They give us access to the to the uh, all their uh, uh, internal uh, uh, tools. Um, is this real? Is it, yeah, is this, is this that, was, that was that was <laughs> actually a, a, a real uh, page that we found uh, during a website. <laughs> <laughs> it's in the name, super secret ninja compile script creator with freaking lasers. There's I know that, wow. was, that <laughs> was one of my favorite. That's why I had to put it on the on the slide uh, because that's that's really something that we found. Uh, some developers they try to do it and put it on the website, thinking that nobody's going to find it, uh, except that Bobble will will find it. I think it was. Will, will oh find wow. It. Um, the typical uh, uh, SSH key that we find again on on servers directly. Um, one of the main difference between um, the tools like Git Guardian and, and publishing uh, uh, keys on, uh, on on GitHub and the, the work that you guys do is um, it gets detected pretty quickly. So it gets burned. Uh, uh, I say burn. It's like somebody is going to exploit it within minutes of being uh, uh, published on on GitHub. I don't know if you have some some statistics on on that and how quickly. Uh, the key goes from being published to being exploited. Uh, from our perspective as pen testers, uh, it's not as useful as it used to be because there's now there's so many uh, uh, attackers or, or criminals monitoring this and exploiting it within minutes. Um, the difference between us doing pen tests and uh, bad guys is the pen test is in the point in time. So we have to be really lucky that a developer is going to uh, uh, publish a, a key or a secret uh, during the time of the pen test, but once the pen test is done, the, the attackers won't stop. I mean, they are like uh, 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 scanning the, the, the internet all day long and looking for, for things to exploit. Uh, the, the other difference uh, between the pen test and the bad guys is the pen test is targeted to a, our customer, whereas the, the, the bad guys or the, the attackers, uh, most of these attacks are opportunistic. So whatever secret they're going to find, they're going to go after uh, um, the company that leaks this, uh, those, those secrets. Uh, whether they purchase a pen test or not, uh, uh, it's, that doesn't matter to them. Um, so that's the main uh, difference. So when we can find secrets like this that are not published in in public repository, uh, they have a much longer uh, lifespan and they can stay on the server for years uh, without anybody uh, noticing it. Uh, now, like few years uh, back, I mean, there was AWS keys that would be uh, 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 leaked even on GitHub. 
and we could use now within like seconds they get disabled by AWS, which is good thing because but the reason they did this is because the attackers were exploiting it also within minutes. Um, so anything that we can yeah. find that is not uh, uh, publicly available, uh, that's why I, the, the dark web and the, the things that dark owl is also useful is things that is still on the internet, but nobody really knows about it. Uh, it's a lot more valuable um, because the, the lifespan of the value of this, this information, uh, it's, it's much greater. Um, so yeah, for this one, obviously Where? that was pretty uh, uh, easy. Uh, SSH key just gave us access to the, 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 the kingdom. It's just a misconfiguration. And it turns out that they actually configured the web server uh, through their uh, home directory. And then we could get access to the, to the SSH key. So from there, that's my favorite kind of, of misconfiguration because there's almost nothing to exploit. I mean, the exploit is just trying to find this misconfiguration. Now we have the key. We don't even have to find like a, a crazy zero day exploit or vulnerability. Use the key and we get in the server. And then from there, try to move on to, to other targets. That's uh, super interesting. We're, we're getting close to running out of time. So what I think I might do is I might invite uh, everyone back onto the stage and uh, run through some, some questions. So Philippe, I'll, I'll leave you here and I'll just bring on uh, Mark and uh, Eric in one second. And if you guys could just unmute yourself as well, that would be uh, great. All right, here we go. Um, so now's the opportunity, everyone, to, to ask some questions. Again, please use the question tab because the chat gets a bit noisy and it's hard to uh, um, uh, let's find everyone wants. OK. Um, so we have some ones. I'm assuming this one here is, uh, is for Gigali and, and, and Eric. Uh, can different platforms be covered by your tooling, like GitLab, Jira, Notion, Slack, et cetera? Uh, so yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So we have uh, actually we have a CLI called GigiSheet that is able to actually uh, scan other platform like uh, Docker images, like uh, S S3 buckets. But like uh, for like native integration, we are still we still have like all the VCS so GitLab, GitHub, Azure DevOps, and Bitbucket. So because like what we find in the in our analysis is like most of the secrets are leaked on on vcs right now and uh yeah i think the 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 tough part is really the remediation and really if you if you succeed to remove all the secrets of your vcs this would be great but definitely it's uh, there are secrets leaking in other platforms and it's definitely a problem to tackle all right the, the the next question thanks eric the next question is for mark and this one's actually uh, referring to i guess dark web currencies so you, this question was asked when you were talking about you know, the fact that they, they they leak it, you know, for credit, for social credits. You know, is is there kind of level to this? So the question exactly is, um, would it mean that you would have to, you know, leak information to gain reputation to gain access to, you know, higher levels of, of secrets? That's absolutely correct. The the whoever is asking that question, I I compressed my comment into a very short period of time. When I mean credit, uh, it I mean reputation on a platform. And um, oftentimes users have to share information in order to get to another level to get access to even more uh, rarer types of data. So that's absolutely right. When I talk about social credit or credit, I'm talking really about reputational credit. Got it. Um, I guess this one here is for, for everyone. Uh, so Mark, we'll, we'll, I guess we'll maybe start with you. And then what is your opinion on encrypted secrets? Does, does it produce a lot of positives by secret scanning tools? So, I mean, does this make it uh, more difficult to find from the dark web or exploit, or can can we can we uncover this encrypt these encryption when we encrypt credentials? Yeah, well, um, you can. Uh, so there are two. Uh, I want to make sure we're talking about the the same type of encryption. Oftentimes, um, credentials that are put in the dark net will have hashed passwords. Uh, associated with them. And we can see that and we can detect that as a hash password and we can actually classify that as a hash pass password. Um, uh, you, clearly, it's going to generate a lot of false positives uh, by uh, by scanning tools. I think that's just part and parcel of it. We're getting better at understanding what those are and how, and and categorizing that set of data. But I'll, I'll defer to Eric as to whether or not they um, uh, have an effect in terms of your scanning uh, tools and, and do they result in false positives? 
Yeah, so it's yeah, it's a great question. So I will say for us, Ash credential is not considered as uh, I will say secrets. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, if it's an encrypted credential, like uh, for example, um, certificates or like SSH key, if the encryption is weak and actually you it's it's breakable, I definitely think it's a leak. I don't think it's so common in terms of frequency, so you find way more like actually quite uh, like uh, private key and public key couple uh, export on. On GitHub, but yeah, I would say it's definitely a, it's definitely a subject. So, but definitely we need to filter by if we take all the encrypted credentials, there will be way too many false positive. But if we segment to yeah stuff that are actually that are weak encryption and that are currently uh, that we can break break with uh, the algorithm, it's yeah definitely doable. All right, I have a question here for Philippe. Um, you know, how how much do secret vaults actually keep hacking from accessing secrets? You know, how would you try and hack a company that uses as a secrets manager? Uh, it's actually pretty uh, efficient, but with the caveat that because it contains so many secrets, it becomes the first or the primary uh, uh, target. Um, so uh, we had some examples where uh, we had some customers using vault. Uh, sadly, they were not using it the right way, so the the root key for uh, uh, Vault was in the environment variable. So as long as we managed to compromise one of the server uh, and get root access, then we had the key. And then from there, it's the impact is even worse because now we're not like stuck to just this one server, but we have access to all the keys from all the vault. Uh, and that was the root key. So not only we had access to one vault, but we had access to all the vault of all the customers. Um, so uh, it's pros and cons, as long as it's, properly implemented and used, uh, it's very efficient. Uh, the problem is sometimes it's not well understood and uh, just having the, this key in the via, uh, environment variable uh, gives you like the key to the kingdom and it's like the, the primary target for uh, an attacker to go after this vault. So uh, it's good, but if it's well, well used. That's great. I, I'm thinking and here, thinking back, so I, wish, I wish we were all in the... I wish we were all in the same room so we could have a beer and, and, and listen to each other's <laughs> stories. <laughs> and and to, go, to go back just to the previous question about the encryption, uh, uh, from an attacker perspective, it, uh, again, it, it depends how the encryption is used. Quite often we see that the secrets are encrypted, but the key, the encryption key is stored with the secret, so it's like pretty much useless. It just makes it hard to detect, yeah. but it doesn't bring any value uh, because an attacker will have access to the system and be able to decrypt the, the, those keys. Uh, for the hash, Depending on the type of hash now, uh, forget about the SHA-1 and MD5 because we have like this hardware that will crack all those and and then brute force up to 10 characters in, in less than a day now. Uh, um, so there's better hashing algorithm, uh, but if it's uh, the older algorithm or hashing without a salt, so all the passwords are, are, hashed with, uh, are just simply hashed without any random keys. Uh, it's 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 not bringing. I mean, it's it's slowing down the attacker, but it's not stopping them. This one here is quite interesting. It's like, hey, hey Eric, what's the difference between a, D, a you know uh, a DLP, a data loss prevention tool, uh, to sequence detection? I imagine, uh, and can it be prepared? Because you have some uh, get some experience on DLPs. <laughs> Yeah, I would say Git Guardian solves uh, a part of the yeah, data loss prevention world. So we are really focused on uh, secrets on public GitHub. Even I would say our, our main focus is really more code security and so secret detection. So trying to improve the, the overall gen of, of code, starting with secret detection and after other vertical. But DLP is a way bigger world. And yeah, I think Philippe has, has, has like talking about it is really about finding like open server in the wild, uh, open FTP uh, server that will contain sensitive documents. You have also like the dark web and the deep web as Mark mentioned about like, it's it's really, I would say it's trying to solve the problem is like, what's my digital fo footprint on the public and like a deep internet and how can an attacker use it? And I will say a yeah, secret on GitHub as, is a portion of that. That's actually really effective. And that you should consider, but it's a fraction of the of the space. Okay, that's great. Well, I think we probably have time for one more. We're over time uh, at the moment, uh, but uh, uh, let's see if we can have one more. This one here uh, is interesting. Uh, Eric, I'll refer to you first, but I, I might see if there's any kind of uh, if Mark maybe can can provide some insight too. 
do we see any correlation between cloud provider usage and leaked secrets? This is interesting because I know last year we had some interesting insights into this. Um, so, so, so what can what can we see from the secrets that we leak? Uh, yes, so de definitely, uh, there is definitely a correlation between the uh, the number of, of secrets leaked uh, and the popularity of cloud providers. It's just sometimes you have like, uh, you can have outliers. So if, if somebody decides to try to, to publish like 1 million keys uh, on repo, you, you have some people that have funny behavior on, on public GitHub that can actually uh, create some anomalies in the statistic. But yeah, usually it's really correlated. So you see... AWS first after Azure, uh, Azure and after like GCP, which is uh, basically the order of popularity uh, right now in terms of usage. And uh, I mean, what was interesting last year too is is like very young companies we were seeing kind of when they launch and seeing their secrets ramp up, um, which is which is really interesting. Mark, do, do you guys see see insights like this for for you know what? what tools are kind of becoming most popular. And I guess we can extend this beyond cloud providers into and what you're seeing leaks. You're seeing lots of leaks of, you know, Twilio and something. So you kind of can almost monitor usage this way. Yeah, I mean, there is a direct correlation between volumetric usage and the amount of data that gets leaked because they're bigger targets. So if you have a bigger target and they're, they're being hit by more people and more data is being extracted or more leaks are being extracted and that data makes its way into the, so I think it, to echo Eric, the, you know, obviously the size of the particular target makes a difference in terms of the correlation and, and what we see. The, the exception to that is occasion, you know, the occasional random, you know, popular small site that gets really attacked, but you no, know, by and large, yes, there is a correlation. Okay, great. Well, look, we've gone a little bit over, and, I, and I'm conscious of all of your time um, because you're you you you're all. Uh, I feel we feel very privileged that you are here with us today. So I want to uh, thank you all uh, for for being here, um, and I'll just encourage everyone to please uh, make sure you check out the Dark Al um, Netregard and also the State of Secrets World report for 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 more information. Everyone, ha all of us have lots of information about our, our, our fields on our blogs, our different reports, different white papers. So please make sure yeah, you go and check those out. And with that, uh, we'll finish it off here. So thank you guys so much. Uh, it's been a pleasure. And I really hope that we can have you back on a webinar again. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.